and it could be the culprit in the case of the stabbed snorkeler. But I'm left with one nagging question. How does a fish reacting to lantern light at night connect to an attack that happened in broad daylight? Back on the main island, there's been a development. Word has gotten out to the family of the snorkeling victim, and they've invited me to join them at a local restaurant. Lena Hermawan was 39, and the mother of two young boys. Her husband, Benny, and his cousin, Thurley, were both at the beach the day Lena was attacked. I've been walking about 20 meters, and I heard people screaming at, at my back. I turned around and saw my wife being carried by a man. Thurley tells me she was actually in the water with Lena when the tragedy happened. After several hours snorkeling together, they were finally heading back towards the shore. Suddenly, two fish leapt clear of the water. One narrowly missed the women. The other struck Lena in the face. After the fish got through the, the eye, it's blood anywhere, everywhere. Everywhere is blood. Many, many blood. Then Benny shows me an item from the scene that he thinks might interest me. Lena's necklace and earrings. So she was wearing this yes. uh, at the time. This is potentially a vital clue. The missing link between night and day. As sunlight sparkled off this jewelry, did it provoke a reaction from the fish, just as my flashlight did? I remember a story in Botswana where a tigerfish was attracted by the shiny crucifix around a man's neck. It's possible the fish that impaled Lena was reacting in the same way, mistaking flashes of light from her jewellery for potential prey. If you're a predator, you strike first and ask questions later. Whatever the case, Lena was extremely unlucky. According to her husband, the attack happened at five o'clock in the afternoon. Reef fish can be habitual feeders, so I'm returning to the beach at the same time of day to see if I can find this coral killer. Instead of actually fishing in the conventional way, I'm thinking of doing a different kind of hunting. I've seen the sorry fish that the sea gypsies hold responsible for the attacks in Sampella, and I think it could be the culprit here too. To prove that, I first have to place it at the scene of the crime and get a positive ID. At first, all I see are the same innocent looking fish I witnessed on my previous dive. But then, something else flashes into view. My underwater camera captures a streamlined fish with a dagger-like snout and a mouth full of teeth. This looks like the fish I saw out on the Sampella reef, the fish the sea gypsies call sorry. In the daylight, I can see that it's what I know as a needlefish. And it's clearly at home here, on the reef where the snorkeler was struck. The predatory needlefish can grow to five feet long, and those elongated jaws hold as many as 200 teeth. When closed, its jaws form a rigid and sharp point, like the end of a dagger. There's actually lots of fish species that are known to jump out of the water at certain times. What's not so well known is why they actually do this. There's one theory which says some of the time this might be to get rid of parasites on the skin or in the gills. Fish don't have hands, they can't pick them off. So if they come out of the surface and then whack down on their flank, this might 
clear some of those parasites off. More often, though, uh, it tends to be when fish are alarmed. They perceive some kind of threat, which they assume is under the water, so if they come up into the air, they're maybe avoiding that threat. In the case of needlefish, there they are. Imagine them at night time, suddenly a light falls on the surface, and they respond by accelerating but coming out of the water. But the thing with needlefish, particularly when they're hunting, this jumping behavior can be pretty unpredictable. So it's all very well saying keep out of their way, but in practice, that's not so easy because very often you don't know they're gonna jump until after they've actually jumped. It's easy to imagine the damage this fish could do, traveling at its top speed of 40 miles an hour. But the only way to know for certain if that jaw could pierce a woman's eye socket is to get my hands on one. But there's no way I'll capture this speed demon underwater. The bony-jawed needlefish is also tough to hook. It is, it is, it's a fish. Here we go. Ah. Ah! That's off. I think, in a way, I might have been lucky just to keep it on that long. The trouble is, they got very bony jaws. That didn't stay on. With fishing time running out, I decide to switch things up. I change boats, getting myself lower to the water, and employ a little island ingenuity. What the locals do for this fish is they use this. It's just a piece of uh, rope that's been unpicked. Something like a needlefish, lots of small teeth, comes along, chomps onto that, and those teeth just get tangled up in all those strands. Eventually, something strikes. OK, stop, 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 stop. There's one on here, there's one on here. Taking it very, very gently. It's secured only by a tangle of fibres, so bringing this fish in is a delicate operation. I'm relying purely on tangle, not on hook hold. This is a completely different way of playing a fish. Keeping enough tension. That's a needlefish. I can finally take a good look at this fish's lethal business end. Well, I've seen these in the water, but to see this um, close up is really something very different. Holding this needlefish with its large, light-sensitive eyes, it's easy to imagine how it could have been drawn to Lena's jewellery and startled by the Sampella fisherman's lanterns. But I can't take my eyes off that long, sharp jaw. If you're a small fish, then the, the weapons you have to worry about are, the, are those needle-sharp teeth. But if you're a person, uh, like the snorkeler, uh, in the water, then it's not so much those teeth it's the whole snout that becomes the weapon. And you just have a very, very small point on the end. And even something that size moving at speed through the water, that, that is almost like a dagger. And there are numerous places in the body where if, if that went in just a couple of inches, that could be fatal. For me, this case is finally closed the end of one of my most unusual investigations. Normally, when I'm looking for a fish that can kill a person, I'm looking for something big. But not always. Sometimes small is deadly. And the needlefish is a perfect example of this. 
As always, this was a case of somebody being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being almost unimaginably unlucky. The chances of the same thing happening to you or me are almost non-existent. So no need to keep away from the beach. But knowing what I know now, if I ever see shoals of small bait fish thronging the shallows, perhaps occasionally scattering or jumping out of the water in response to some unseen threat, perhaps that's one time not to get in the water. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like the River Monsters page.